Thank you, Peter. This looks to be a great conference in prospect. Morena, tenakoto katoa. He aha te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Yes, it is people, people, people. People are the reason for the work you do, and the work you do is in primary care is very much part, for many of you, of your raison d'etre. Pete Foley and I were, in, uh, were both close friends and close colleagues, and latterly 12 years in partnership in Napier, before his untimely death in 2013. It is an honour to deliver this address. This address is not a eulogy to Pete Foley. However, it could have been an appropriate time for a eulogy for the NZMA. I would say that if Peter were here today, he would be both very happy and very distressed. Happy to be amongst colleagues and enjoying them with his renowned collegiality and conviviality, and especially as a former two-term very effective chair of the NZMA, he would be welcoming the prospect of medical politics. He would be extremely distressed, as am I, at the demise of the NZMA. <clears throat> Today, I will not be addressing cutting edge medicine. I'm speaking from the short distance of retirement, and this is a distillation of some thoughts. And I do main con maintain contact with the media, the medical press, and I do visit, as I have not been locked out of, the GP Facebook page, and that provides me with updates and uh, a, a, a thermometer of the times. I'm still very interested in your world. There may be some hint of the four Yorkshiremen and what I have to say, and I do apologize. Are you trying to tell the young people of today that? And they won't believe you. Oh. No, they won't. <laughs> Maybe this address could be treated as an allegory for your consultation page, in which there are a significant list of problems and not necessarily a lot of answers. In general practice, you are continuously juggling uncertainty, playing uh, Cassandra and Pollyanna. Pollyanna hoping for the best, but prefer preparing for the worst, and Cassandra, as I said, preparing for the worst. In your diagnostic process, there will usually be a worst case scenario in mind and you will often work back from there. I do not think there would be much argument in the premise that general practice has the, most burden of, the biggest burden of uncertainty in medicine. Uncertainty when the overriding pressure is for certainty. In this milieu of uncertainty, you make clinical decisions in real time which are mostly well-founded, but which in time may prove to be wrong, with a sometimes unfortunate outcome and a difficult family discussion, an HDC or an ACC process. Sir William Osler, one of the great medical forebears, had this to say about clinical uncertainty. Variability is the law of life. Surrounded by people who demand certainty, the practitioner too often gets into the mind, habit of mind which resents the thought that opinion, not full knowledge, must be his stay and prop. There is no discredit, though at times much discomfort, in this everlasting perhaps with which we have to preface so much connected with the practice of our art. It is, as I said, inherent in the subject. In modern times, precision in medicine has been the overriding value. It is, of course, a great good and a worthy objective, but greater precision does not necessarily reduce uncertainty. The quest for precision becomes mindless, a false trail, when the true need is to gain a better understanding of the patient. This, that latter quote was from Ian McFinney, who was the founding father of uh, the Canadian Family Medicine Program. So these two statements are possibly not a, a good defence uh, in an HDC review, 
but you must understand the limits of your craft and you must, we must understand our humanity. And the the Theodore Dalrymple's book, Mass Listeria, he has this to say. The belief is now general that man has achieved such mastery over nature that if life turns out to be unfair, human malevolence must be to blame. Death these days is somebody's fault. And when I started medicine, I think death was quite often it was God's will. And now it's somebody's fault. Retrospection via the HDC can be unforgiving. But perhaps there is no more harsh tribunal for a doctor than, as Raymond Tallis says, the convocation of, her, of, the, convocation of the court of her conscience at 3 a.m. Who of us have been there? And this, as Raymond Tallis, is a very uh, interesting book, and I thoroughly recommend it. This brings me to a long-held interest in the health of our profession. I've gained a few insights from physician health meetings and of life, of course. We are better for our patients if we are well in ourselves. Time and again, evidence has been, been presented demonstrating that the two principal determinants of physician health are a healthy workplace and good collegiality. You could hardly have one without the other. We benefit from the support of our colleagues, not only in times of stress. A US study showed that hospital residents who made serious errors and who had a collegial review had a much better outcome in terms of making fewer errors in the future. And conversely, those residents who made serious errors and did not have a collegial review had a much higher rate of, uh, of error in the future. Peer groups are so essential and I would say enjoyable. Physician burnout is a recurring theme and focus has been placed not only on the individual doctor's health but on the doctor's work environment. And a line which has stuck with me is if a fuse blows, was the fuse defective? Or every system is perfectly designed to get the results it does. My periodic visits to the GP Facebook page often reveal stress from time poor colleagues. This stress often related to the tyranny of the inbox. I think the people voicing frustration mostly are not digital dinosaurs like me but are in fact digital natives. Is the electronic health record our friend? Lisa Rosenbaum, MD, thinks maybe not and is published extensively in the New England Journal of Medicine. In the title of uh, one of her papers, and there are quite a number, Transi tra uh, Transitional Chaos or Enduring Harm, the Electronic Health Record and the Disruption of Medicine. She said that physicians seem to acknowledge the use and potential of electronic health records. But, she said, nevertheless, researchers found remarkable electronic health record induced distress. They conclude, no other industry to our knowledge has been under such a universal mandate to adopt a new technology before its effects are fully understood and before technology has reached a level of usability that is acceptable to its core users. And I must say, I struggled. <laughs> Physicians complain about clumsy and unintuitive systems and the number of hours spent clicking, typing, and trying to navigate them, which is more than the hours they spend with patients. Someone said death by a thousand clicks. I first came across this quote in 2004 in an address, at the end of an address given by a highly respected retired US surgeon who had suffered major depression throughout his life and at one stage 
was going to be subjected to a frontal lobotomy. His talk ended with this quote, the beginning of which we are all familiar with. Um, that's attributed to Philo, but there's, an, there's quite an argument about where that has come from. But I think it is, it is a great quote, and uh, we all know the first two words, obviously. Self-care is, of course, a cornerstone of good health, with three important pillars being good diet, exercise, and sleep. Self-care is having your own GP and not prescribing for yourself or your family. I think that is pretty difficult now anyway. The pharmacists seem to be quite resistant. A self-care tip relating to holidays I learned many years ago. This is the Tarzan rule as applied to holidays. The Tarzan rule states that when you are on holiday, you must be like Tarzan, swinging through the vines. And before you let go of one vine, you have to have another vine lined up. So too with your holidays. In terms of the public health issues we face, COVID has been dominate, dominating us. And to quote from Christchurch a journalist, Joe Bennett, COVID is no black death, but look at what it's done. It's killed millions, locked down billions, grounded planes, tied up ships, ruined businesses, fostered violence, bred doubt in science, and emboldened the crazies. I did not work in primary care in, during COVID, and I was very pleased not to have to spend days in full PEP. I've been on the sidelines, but what I did observe was the dedication of our nation's GPs and their general practice colleagues in dealing with this pandemic in real time. A lot of it after hours I saw as evidenced on Facebook. Sadly, there seemed to be a persistence of the health bureaucracy's uh, inability to embrace your competence and your great loyalties. You are playing a huge role in keeping our people safe and have made a huge contribution to the the fact that our country has done so well. I commend in particular Brian Betty and Samantha Merton and congratulate Brian on his recent award. Their efforts in ensuring the cohesion in this uh, difficult time has been outstanding. I think sadly this uh, disrupt in the bureaucracy in primary care is set to continue with the new health reforms. This just a recent headline in the Dom Post. And followed up by a letter from one of my GP colleagues in Napier expressing a frustration at what seems to be repetition of history. As well as draining the national coffers, COVID has spawned a sub-pandemic of anxiety. So in, the, in a, a world which already has a huge prevalence of anxiety, I think anxiety must be one of the most talked about mental health conditions. In my later years of practice, it was a boon to have the use of mindfulness, CBT, and FACT to complement uh, medication use and often um, obviate the use of it. And it was recently heartening to see a news clip of Sir John Kerwin bringing the mighty program to, to, to junior schools. This is a mental health program for junior schools. And I think we really must have better health literacy built into the curriculum of our schools. Does school tuck shops still offer Pepsi? And I think perhaps Michelle Montaigne was the father of CBT, and I've used this quote many times in talking with anxious patients. My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. 
I do not doubt that social media is a profound generator of anxiety for some, as the algorithms of these platforms are trying to lure us down rabbit holes of negativity. And Obama said, today's social media has a grimness to it. We're so fatalistic about the steady stream of bile and vitriol that's on there. But it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, if we're going to succeed, it can't be that way. And Jacinda Ardern echoed such at Harvard. Social media has to be a tool. But can we stop? How many times have you looked at your phones today? The restless amygdala demands to be appeased. So we check. And here, the amygdala, the, I believe, the driver of a lot of what is bad for us. And I moved to addiction, which was uh, a parallel occupation of mine throughout my 38 years in general practice. In the career of the lifetime of working in addiction, I developed a simple explanation for, pa for severely dependent patients about their alcohol and drug dependence. The bald summary being that it was the nucleus accumbens or the, or, the, or the highs that got them there, and it was the amygdala that kept them there. You were no longer drinking to feel good or get high. You were drinking to not feel bad. The amygdala, our survival center, is driving your addiction. Generally speaking, I think we would be a lot better off if we better understood and had better control over the amygdala. Regular mindfulness is now shown to reduce the size of the amygdala, as well as conferring other undoubted health benefits. So on to alcohol, which was a big part of my uh, time in addiction. And uh, I declare a conflict of interest. This is a representative photo of my recycling bin. <laughs> um, many of those small bottles, uh, brown bottles, are, are of zero alcohol beer. <laughs> Only the guilty explain. So alcohol in uh, nine, uh, 2018, Ganesh uh, Nana from Burrell uh, stated that we had a 7.85 billion cost per annum for alcohol. Prenatally, many of our future citizens are exposed in utero to, to, to the toxic effects of this drug with about uh, 1,800 to 3,000 estimated FASD-affected uh, infants born each year. There has been an unconscionable delay in getting health warnings onto, uh, pregnancy health warnings onto alcohol containers. This started in 1995 and will finally come to fruition 28 years later, next year. This is, that's been scandalous. Similar insults are happening to millions of still developing brains around the world as young people are exposed and often encouraged to take toxic joke doses of alcohol and other illicit drugs. This all before the age of 25, the age of neural maturity. Decades ago when alcohol researchers were researching with rats, they found it very hard to get the rats to drink alcohol. That is until they added sugar. The cynical alcohol industry has done the same in, in pushing the Alcopops, RTDs, which are particularly favoured by a younger drinking cohort. And a myth that was uh, recently exploded that, that it is better for us to have our children drink with us and, and educating them in this way will make them more responsible drinkers. That myth, that, that is now a myth, and the, uh, the, the catch cry is delay, delay, delay. Delay your young child's drinking for as long as possible. Dionysius, the Greek god of wine, even in my very poor photo taken in Corfu, was a well-proportioned and, and quite attractive younger male. The list of potential health harms from alcohol are growing rapidly and will likely continue to do so. Meanwhile, the alcohol lobby successfully opposes the thoroughly researched uh, 2010 Law Commission report which sought to limit the harms of alcohol and uh, sadly that report is buried or perhaps more aptly said drowned. The Romans, who perhaps were more prosaic than the Greeks, 
changed Dionysius' name to Bacchus, and they developed a different depiction of this god, such that he could have been used as the Roman Senate's health warning for, for alcohol. <laughs> a concern I have is the contraction of GP services and possibly their abilities. I say our GPs becoming afraid of the dark, as in urban areas I see more GPs choosing to relinquish their after hours work. That is fair enough, and in the last 10 years of my GP life, I sought to offload all the after hours duties I could. However, there is a danger in that if the exiting GPs reach a critical mass, those remaining won't be able to cope. Primary care happens after hours. Urban GPs may lose their skills in handling the likes of asthma, croup, minor trauma, acute medicine. And they'll find increasingly limiting their practice to nine to five routine care. Soon will it only be our rural colleagues who are doing real urgent GP care. After hours care can be extremely interesting and satisfying. Heightening, heightening our collective generalised anxiety is climate change, and it's a major threat to world health. And I'm sure some of you are from communities who have already borne the brunt of the uh, ill effects of climate change. A very good friend of mine has written this book, and I commend it to you. You could read it in your lunch hour, that is, after you have finished your inbox. It gives light into our politicians' cognitive dissonance in reacting to this emergency. Our screens almost daily deliver portrayals of floods, fires, famines, hurricanes, snowstorms. People wrangle over coal, cars, cows and planes. The underlying driver is consumption or economic growth. Our politicians are wedded to economic growth. And this compounding obviously has a compounding effect on the downside of economic growth, which is the growth of waste. Economic growth is really our planet's enemy, and I think we've got to think of other ways of judging how well we're doing. Oh, this is just about the SUV, and um, I must confess to having an SUV. This was Doonesbury in 2004. Yeah, but I can climb cliffs in it. So just an idea. Advanced care planning and national super. We've all had patients who spend their last few weeks uh, in an ICU bed with the attendant drips and tubes because there's been no clear advanced care plan. There is likely distress for the patient and the family and not to mention the huge cost. Many such situations could have been avoided if there was an advanced care plan. So why not tie the receipt of national super into having made an advanced care plan? Maybe a compulsory civic duty. I guess the liberal, civil libertarians might have uh, quite a lot to say about that. And uh, over time, you, you get to see how some of your patients see you. And I formulated this law. I don't think it'll ever be in, in the medical textbooks, but it's the inverse car law, and this occurred when, when I was in solo practice, I had the use for a while of my sister's very flash Audi sports convertible, and one day a patient said to me, gee doc, that's a nice car, we must be paying you too much. <laughs> a few well, months or so later, he came to see me after seeing a specialist, and I asked him how it went, and he remarked, you know, that specialist, he drove up in an old Subaru. Is he any good? <laughs> Retirement is a state I'm enjoying. Retirement of GPs is a major issue. And on this rostrum, I think in 2019, Professor Poole talked about a 47% projected exit of GPs in the next 10 years. Replacement rates look to be hugely insufficient, and this is an an already depleted and stressed group. How do we fix this? More colleagues from overseas? More exposure of undergrads to new, and new graduates to primary care? I think this is happening and seems to be enjoyed by those um, 
people undergoing the, the, the exposure. Um, and maybe, uh, and of course, nurse practitioners may help. And dare I say, artificial intelligence. There is also concern that for some of our retirees, the process may not be easy. And an important other rule I learnt along with the Tarzan syndrome was to, with regard to retirement, was to anticipate and avoid the Columbus syndrome. This syndrome simply put is, you didn't know where you were going and you didn't know where you were when you got there. So I've gone from gypsy to gypsy. So at the end of this 20 odd minute consultation we have quite a number of problems and not a lot of answers and there are certainly uh, many more problems for that dreaded oh by the way doc expression at the end of your con consultation. I have touched on some areas of stress and concern and negativity but beyond that you have the deepest privilege of working with people throughout their lives and sometimes sharing the most profound events in their lives. You can pay a heavy cost, but the rewards I don't think could be matched in any or many other endeavours. I wish you well, enjoy your conference, and above all, relish the collegiality. Thank you.